In this church, we follow the lectionary. That's not a word that most of us use every day, but it's certainly an important word for those of us who plan and conduct worship services. With the Second Vatican Council, one of the most amazing things, one of the, one of the really wonderful things that happened as a result of the Second Vatican Council, a Roman Catholic gathering of all the bishops in the world. In that council meeting, the Protestants who were present and uh, those who have followed since then agreed to use as a worship resource the Roman Catholic lectionary. Now the lectionary is a way of reading the Bible in our congregations. And Catholic biblical scholars had over the years developed a way to study the Bible for a, a worshiping congregation. It is a three-year process, uh, creatively named year A, B, and C. And uh, each of the years is built around one of the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Year A, is built around uh, Matthew. Year B is built around Mark, and year C is built around the Gospel of Luke. We follow that lectionary in this church, and uh, we are at present moment in year B based around Mark, and our text today is taken from Mark. Will you open your Bibles, please, to Mark chapter 9? And we're going to uh, read the passage that uh, Judy just read to you. It's a little known story, and most of us have skipped it. We tend to read right past it. And we, we get into Jesus' teaching about stumbling blocks, and we fail to read the introductory story. But the introductory story is extremely important. One of Jesus' disciples, John, came to him one day and said, Teacher, we, I assume that means he and other disciples, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. And we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. A very interesting little passage. We tried to stop him because he was not following us. The disciples had developed a world view that said there are two kinds of people. There's us and there's them, and them are not our friends. And so they developed this 
exclusive way of looking at other people and at the world around them. So when they encountered this man who was casting out demons in Jesus' name, but they didn't know him because he wasn't with them as one of the followers of Jesus. He was not one of the chosen 12. They tried to stop him. They said, stop what you're doing. You're not a follower of Jesus. <laughs> but obviously, the man who was, who was casting out demons in Jesus' name was some kind of a follower. He might not have been part of the disciples. He might not have been a part of the group that, that traveled with Jesus and was close to him and was taught by him, but he certainly knew of Jesus and believed him to be somehow related to God and therefore he could cast out demons calling on the name of Jesus. So Jesus obviously said to the disciples, don't stop him. Anybody who does any great act of power using my name is a friend and will not be able to speak evil of me later on. So let him do what he's doing. Jesus had a different way of, of looking at people. He didn't have this uh, idea that the disciples had that there was just us and them. Jesus had three, at least, in his panoply of people. There's us, and there's them, and there's those who aren't against us. Martin Luther King approached it somewhat differently. He said, there's us, and there's them, and then there are all those people of goodwill who might join us if we approach them properly. Well, that's what Jesus was about. There's us, and there's them. And then there are all those people of goodwill who are not hostile to what we're trying to do. If possible, we might even enlist them they're a mission field. There are the people I'm sending you out to call to our fellowship. Must have been a shock for the disciples. They had this nice, tidy little world of us and them. And Jesus was challenging their sense of ownership and their sense of competitiveness and their strong sense of belonging to one another. I find it interesting that the phrase they used, I think it's an oops phrase. In, in Mark's gospel, it says, we tried to stop him because he was not following us. He doesn't say Jesus, that's the oops. He says, us. Well, where did that come from? A strong sense of the, of the disciples' own extra status and power in society? At any rate, they somehow allowed themselves to get between that man who was a miracle worker and Jesus. They put themselves in front of Jesus and blocked somebody who was not an enemy but a friend. That 
third part, those who are not against us. Jesus certainly knew what it was to be confronted by the power and authority of his day. All of this took place in, in the time when the Roman Empire was still expanding in all directions, including north into England. This happened at the same time that Emperor Claudius sent Roman legions into Britain. Jesus and his disciples, on their way to Jerusalem, while Claudius invaded Britain. Well, the path that leads to Jesus is a varied path. Some people stumble into Jesus' presence. Some stagger <laughs> into following him. Some just barge in. But I think probably most of us are awakened by a voice deep within us calling us to take up our cross and follow him. The disciples had good intentions. They weren't trying to block Jesus' ministry. They just kind of happened to do it because they had the wrong way of looking at the world around them. They tried, they tried to copyright Jesus. They tried to get ownership of him in some way. It was sort of like they had their own security check of people's IDs. Are you a follower? Are you part of us? If not, then stop what you're doing. Wrong. The path that leads to Jesus has no boundaries, has no ID check. It has no copyright. Discipleship means welcoming. Discipleship means the door is open wide. There's always room for one more. The call to welcome and service. I was uh, quite impressed as I worked my way through the Washington Post this week because I found there an article by Colbert King, one of their columnists, and I'd like to read part of it to you. My previous column, he writes, drew cheers and ridiculed the faith of people praying and working for peace in the Holy Land, scorning the beliefs of others, especially those holding views not your own, appears to be a universal malady. It seems, however, to have a special application in the Holy Land, where religious leaders are the voices crying out on behalf of the oppressed, needy people who have no helpers. Demolished homes, sick, wounded, thirsty innocents come with the territory of war. So get over it say those who jeer. But that's where the line should be drawn. Such deep human suffering can never be accepted. Today's focus in the Middle East, the setting on the other hand, could be here at home where communities languish in need 
violence has an upper hand and where justice is a sometime thing. These environments abroad and in this country are where people with a higher purpose come into play. I'm talking about men and women of faith who go into places and get into things that most others would just as soon avoid, but of course love to talk about and fume about. But people worthy of praise are those between the Mediterranean Sea and the eastern bank of the Jordan River and their counterparts closer to home who are serving a cause greater than themselves. Their work stands in sharp relief to the posture of governments in the region. The governments, the governments see nation states. The governments see land and secure borders backed by forces of arms. To men and women of faith, however, all people have value, regardless of boundaries, places of origin, or parents of birth. Who are they to weigh in? Consider that they're responding to a higher calling. Scoff, if you want. Thank you, Mr. King. So, Jesus' disciples said, we, we found this man casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop them because he was not following us. And Jesus said, do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able to reject us later on. Whoever is not against us is for us. I don't know if you've ever meditated on that passage before. I never have. I've glossed, I've gone right past it until it got brought to my attention because of today's lectionary. A marvelous passage that shows us Jesus' meaning, his hope his prayer for the world and for us. Amen.